Although the term Zerstorer, or destroyer, when applied to aircraft has become virtually synonymous with one type, namely the Messerschmitt Vf 110, it is actually representative of a number of types that emerged in the 30s in different countries. The concept of a long-range twin-engine strategic fighter found its advocates in Poland, France, the USA and Japan, as well as Germany. While Japan was to develop the Kawasaki Ki-45, which saw wide-scale service in the Pacific War, it was in Germany that the concept was most vigorously pursued. It would be wrong to think that such a type originated in the mid-30s. In fact, the need for such an aircraft was seen as early as the First World War. Operations with bombers such as this Gotha, which operated over enemy territory devoid of fighter escort, had prompted thoughts of a heavy fighter with sufficient range to fly with the bombers to their targets. It would also possess the ability to deal with enemy fighters sent up to shoot down the incoming attackers. Such a plane would also need to carry a heavy armament. It was also envisaged that such an aircraft could be used to fly far-ranging offensive missions over enemy territory. This concept was far too ambitious for the limited technology of the day to even begin to address. But this, notwithstanding, the whole notion of such an aircraft is flawed in as much as it is a compromise in all things. To attain the range, the plane has to be fairly large. If so, then it becomes unmaneuverable and unable to dogfight with the lighter and more nimble fighters it's seeking to destroy. A heavy airframe needs powerful engines, which in themselves raise the weight in a real sense, the concept of the destroyer was to military aviation what the battlecruiser was to warships. A seemingly good idea at the time, but fundamentally flawed. That in itself, however, was not enough to kill it. One man who was undoubtedly attracted to the idea of such an aircraft ended the First World War as a famous fighter pilot. He won the Paul Lemerit and the Iron Cross First Class and was commander of the infamous Flying Circus. Fifteen years later, Hermann Goering, as the second most powerful man in the Third Reich, and the commander of the still clandestine Luftwaffe, was able to use his power and influence to see that such an aircraft would have a role and place in the new German Air Force. The specification for a Kampf destroyer was won by the firm of Messerschmitt, their prototype BF-110, flying on the 12th of May 1936. First production of the 110B took place in July 1938, with the type being powered by UMO engines. Just 45 of this variant was manufactured. Pre-war film of the 110 is very rare. This short clip shows two BF-110Bs taking part in war games in 1937. They wear the large pre-war swastika on their fins. Although the destroyer Gruppen were cultivated as elite units in Germany before the war and participated extensively in the Polish campaign, which began on the 1st of September 1939, no footage was taken of the type in action. Some four Gruppen were spread among the two Luftflotten committed to Case White. The BF 110s flew mainly escort sorties and were employed extensively in the tactical role supporting the army. This 110C was operated by the destroyer Gruppen of LG 1. BF 110s played a significant role in the destruction of 12 Wellington bombers in the Battle of the Heligoland Bight in December 1939. Such heavy losses led the RAF to switch to night bombing. Commander of the 110s in the Heligoland Bight was Wolfgang Falk, who was soon to emerge as the formative figure in Germany's night fighting force and was to be a major player in overseeing its development throughout the war. BF 110Cs of 1 ZG 76 under the command of Falk provided top cover for the JU-52 units landing in southern Norway during Operation Weserubung in April 1940. They were, however, rapidly pulled back to Germany.
When, on the 10th of May 1940, Hitler launched the Wehrmacht against France and the Low Countries, the Luftwaffe could deploy BF 110s belonging to four destroyer Geschwader. These included ZG 1, 2, 52, and 76, and were allocated to Luftflotten 2 and 3. While in the opening phase of the offensive, the 110s found themselves engaging in aerial combat. Most sorties after the initial period saw them operating in the ground attack role. Rapid movement forward from base to base in support of the fast-moving mobile columns became the order of the day. It was over Dunkirk when the 110 units came into contact with large numbers of RAF Spitfires and Hurricanes for the first time that doubts began to arise over the alleged superiority of the 110. High losses were experienced, and as a precursor of what was to come over England a few months later, the 110 pilots found themselves unable to mix it with the more manoeuvrable British fighters. With the surrender of France and the rejection by Britain of his terms for peace, Hitler ordered the aerial campaign against England to begin as the first stage in his invasion plan. Goering's vaunted destroyers would now face their severest test. In the period of recovery after the battle for France, the destroyer Geschwaden went through a significant upgrading as new subtypes of the C and the D model were delivered. In Norway, two and three ZG-76 had taken delivery of the extended range BF-110D. Epro Bung's Gripper 210, an experimental trials unit, took delivery of the first fighter-bomber variant in the C-4 and started operating them attacking shipping in the channel. By the time the battle for Britain opened, the Luftwaffe could dispose of no fewer than 289 BF-110s for operation. Here, BF-110Cs of ZG-2, wearing their famous Bamberger Hunter insignia, are seen taxiing out prior to a mission over England. The strategy behind the employment of the 110 rested on its superior range. They were tasked with flying ahead of the bomber formations to entice the RAF fighters up into combat forcing them to expend their fuel and ammunition before the arrival of the bombers. In the meantime, the Spitfires and Hurricanes needing to refuel and rearm would be found doing so by the Luftwaffe bombers as they arrived over the airfield. This, however, turned on the assumption, certainly unquestioned at the time the battle began, that the 110s could mix it with the RAF fighters and come out on top. Here, the plan fell down. Arriving over England, the 110s found themselves experiencing once more what some had first encountered over Dunkirk. Their charges simply could not follow the highly manoeuvrable Spitfires and Hurricanes, which flew rings around the heavier German fighter. By comparison, it was sluggish and vulnerable to fire from the rear, the gunner proving of no worth with his single machine gun. Luftwaffe commanders overseeing the campaign looked on with some concern as the numbers of 110s being lost over England rose sharply. Goering was incensed that his elite fighters were being handled in this fashion and blamed the pilots, claiming that they were not using them properly. By the end of August, no fewer than 120 110s had been lost, a further 83 being shot down in September, forcing the disbandment of a number of destroyer units. This BF-110 belonging to ZG-26 horse vessel has crash-landed on a Kent beach. Its crew taken prisoner. Symbolic of the immense loss of experienced crew was Hauptmann Walter Rubensdorfer, commander of Eprobung's Gripper 210, shot down on August the 15th over Croydon. The decimation of the destroyer Geschwaden in the Battle of Britain saw disbandment and amalgamation of a number of formations. As the surviving Staffen were pulled back into Germany to rehabilitate and be drawn to pastures new, a number of 110 units stayed in France. Air-110s are seen giving top cover to Kriegsmarine units in the Bay of Biscay, where they quite frequently came under attack from British aircraft. 
These 110s belong to KG-76 and carry the famous Shark Mouth insignia on their nose. The first part of 1941 saw the movement of a large number of 110s to the Mediterranean theatre in support of the German invasion of Yugoslavia and Greece and as part of the Luftwaffe detachment sent to aid and give air cover to Rommel's Afrika Corps. One and second grouper KG-26 and second staffel KG-76 were used almost exclusively in the fighter-bomber role. In North Africa, 110 units included the third grouper of ZG-26, which was later joined by the second staffel. Although flying against the RAF, the North African theatre provided a more benign environment for the 110s, as they were not opposed by the Spitfire. The primary task of the 110 became that of ground support and acting as a long-range fighter bomber operating in concert with Rommel's fast-moving ground forces. In the desert, the range of the 110 was a great advantage, allowing it to roam over the whole battlefield. A number of those seen here are carrying bombs and are the C4 Yabo variant. The worst enemy of all for the ground crews of the 110s was the all-pervading dust. It was necessary to fit filters to the carburetor intakes to prevent the jets becoming clogged up, causing damage and wear to the engines. On this occasion, a small collection of British Army lorries and armoured cars, probably well within what they imagined to be their own lines, are being strafed by the 110s. The 110 was also employed for photo reconnaissance of enemy lines. This model, a C5, employed a single RB5030 camera being carried to the aircraft by the ground crew. BF 110s served in North Africa throughout the campaign. Later variants made their way into the theatre and were employed extensively for ground support and Stuka escorts until the defeat of Rommel at El Alamein and the withdrawal into Tunisia. This picture of a BF-110 preparing to take off gives a very graphic impression of the clouds of dust raised as the throttles are opened up. Destined to become a major theatre of war for all variants of the 110 until 1944 was Russia. These 110 G2s of the Vespen Geschwader date from late 1942. Operating to the fore of the advancing panzer columns in the advance into the USSR on June the 22nd, 1941, and obtaining up-to-date photographs of Soviet positions and deployments, were the Henschel HS-126s of the Army Reconnaissance Squadrons. Rapid examination of the images returned from the battlefield were then communicated to Luftwaffe units. Following the successful surprise assaults on Soviet airfields, which had caught most of the Red Air Force on the ground in the opening hours of the invasion, many Luftwaffe units were turned over to support of the advancing German columns. Although four Luftflotten were committed to Barbarossa, the number of 110 formations involved was small, with most serving elsewhere. Only the second grouper of ZG-26, serving in the 8th Flieger Corps, and Schnell Kampfgeschwader 210 in the Second Flieger Corps saw action in this period. It is 110Cs from the former unit that are seen in this film. Of interest is the tethered observation balloon which the aircraft passed and which was used to mark the forward German positions. Upon reaching their target area, the JU-88s begin their attack. The 110s, while flying top cover, are now free to engage upon their secondary function for the mission, which is a fry yag or free hunt. While vast numbers of Soviet aircraft had been destroyed on the ground, a significant few survived the initial German onslaught to fly against the invaders. As most Soviet fighter types at this period were decidedly obsolescent, the 110 was able to deal with many of the Soviet types they encountered. The heavy nose armament of the 110, comprising of two 20mm cannon and four 7.9mm machine guns, 
gave it a heavy punch. It was admirably suited to the role of ground attack, and in the absence of a heavy anti-aircraft fire that would later make such operations extremely hazardous on the Eastern Front, the 110s proved highly effective. Indeed, the 110 C4s of Major Karl Heinz Stricker's Schnell Kampfgeschwader 210 were tasked from the outset with the low-level assault on Soviet airfields and bridges. This Yebo variant of the 110 was designed as a fighter bomber. It was fitted with two ETC-250 bomb racks under the fuselage and powered by two Daimler-Benz 601N engines and first saw action over the English Channel in July 1940. By the time this film of the 110s in action had been taken, both Messerschmitt and Fokker Wolf had taken the BF 110 out of production. The former had already geared up to produce the 110's success of the ME 210 at its Augsburg and Regensburg plants. However, reports of the premature demise of the 110 were greatly exaggerated, for problems with the ME 210 would see its predecessor reintroduced in 1942 to rejuvenate the destroyer Geschwaden. As with all other types employed by the Luftwaffe in the atrocious Russian winter of 1941-42, the severe cold brought particular problems. The 110's water-cooled Daimler-Benz engines needed to be run throughout the night to stop them freezing. Usage of the 110 as a Yebo to attack Soviet ground forces was very high all through this period. Consideration of the Junkers 88 in the heavy fighter role began almost as soon as its superb flying attributes became apparent. The type possessed a long range, fine handling qualities and high speed, all of which made it a prime candidate for employment as a destroyer. The prototype was based on an A1 airframe and appeared in early 1940, with the production C2 model entering squadron service with KG-40 in Norway during the spring. The more numerous C4 and C6 destroyer variants employed the later JU-88A5 and A4 bomber airframes. The glazed nose of the bomber was replaced with a metal cap, which mounted a number of 20mm cannon and 7.92mm machine guns, the quantity and combination depending on field modifications. The heavy firepower saw the type employed on all fronts in the anti-shipping, train busting and ground attack roles. This C-6 has its nose painted to simulate the bomber variant to fool Soviet fighters. One of the more unusual roles for which the ME-110 was employed was as a glider tug for the massive ME-321 Gigant. First flown in February 1941, the lack of aircraft with sufficient power to tow the glider into the air saw its designers alight upon an unusual proposal employing three BF-110s acting in concert. The subsequent Troika Schlepp, as this arrangement came to be known, was not without its pitfalls. Even with three 110s, the Gigant also needed the help of rockets to help it get airborne. On at least one occasion, the Troika Schlepp failed, and all four aircraft plunged into the ground, killing all involved, including a large number of soldiers being carried for testing purposes. However, even the Troika Schlepp was not a solution. That arrived only with the Schwilling variant of the Heinkel 111 bomber. The reusable rockets were dropped by parachute after the Gigant was airborne. Messerschmitt had been working on a second generation destroyer to replace the 110 as early as 1937, with the prototype seen here taking to the air on the 2nd of September 1939. Designed as a multi-role aircraft, including that of a dive bombing replacement for the Stuka, the high expectations attending the new 210 were to remain unrealized. 
as development flying revealed the type to be plagued with problems. Even so, 1,000 ME-210As were ordered in 1940, entering service with the Luftwaffe test Eprobungsgruppe 210 at the end of that year. By the end of 1941, the 210 was deemed to be a failure, shot through with so many defects that it was described as being vicious to fly. Even so, the investment in the type had been so great that heavily modified 210A1s were delivered to the second group of ZG-1 and elements of ZG-26 in Sicily in 1942 as replacements for the 110s. It was as a heavy fighter that 210 formations found themselves thrown into combat against Anglo-American forces in Tunisia in November 1942. ME-210s are seen here attacking a forward airfield manned by British and American forces. The 210s come in at low level to drop their bombs amid a hail of anti-aircraft fire. Heavy damage is inflicted on the Wildcat fighters and other types parked on the airfield. No 210s are lost on this sortie, and they make good their escape. Although the 210 rapidly left the inventory of the Luftwaffe, it nevertheless acquired a good reputation while serving in the Hungarian Air Force. Built under license, it entered service in June 1943 and was employed as a home defence fighter against bombers of the US 15th Air Force and also as a fast light bomber through to 1945. The decision to abandon the ME-210 was taken in April 1942 with Messerschmitt being ordered to stop production of the type. Although variants of the type were encountered over the British Isles in 1942, in addition to Tunisia, by 1943 the 210 was fading from Luftwaffe service. In substitute for the failed 210, a refined 110 left the Messerschmitt production line in May 1942. Designated the 110 G2, it had an improved airframe and more powerful engines. To enhance versatility, conversion sets were made available to allow it to serve both as a heavy fighter and fighter bomber. First film of the new 110 G2 in action came with a newsreel report of Luftwaffe operations in northern Finland in the summer of 1942. The F-110s of the 7th destroyer Staffel of Jagdgeschwader 5 were seen providing fighter escort for Stukas of 4th Group LG-1 attacking the strategic Soviet port of Mamant. Gun camera film from a 110 shows the downing of a defending cannon-armed 116 Type 17 fighter. Whereas just four 110s had been delivered to the Luftwaffe in February 1942, the cancellation of the 210 and recommencement of 110 production on a wide scale after April saw 577 delivered by the end of that year. However, although there was a re-equipping of existing destroyer Geschwaden, the increasing importance of the type as a night fighter saw a reduction in output of the type as a destroyer. The only BF-110 formation present with the Luftwaffe units concentrated for Operation Zittertel was the Panzer Jager Staffel of Destroyer Geschwader 1. These 110s had originally been part of an experimental flying anti-tank unit set up during the previous year to investigate the suitability of aircraft types in the tank destroyer role. A number of 110Gs mounting a modified 37mm cannon in an under-fuselage fairing had been tested but found unsuitable. However, those employed at Kursk were subsequently returned to normal service as a heavy fighter and operated with Luftblock 6 for the duration of the offensive. Even though the Soviet victory at Kursk marked the real emergence of the Red Air Force, the BF-110 could still be employed in an offensive capacity as a fighter and succeeded in downing many Soviet aircraft. Case, the opponent of the 110 is an Illusion IL-2 Sturmovik. This was a specialized, very heavily armored ground attack aircraft known to the Luftwaffe as the Cementer, 
because of its capacity to absorb heavy punishment before it was shot down. Indeed, the example in this film is taking a lot of fire from the nose guns of the 110. The problem for Soviet pilots flying this type was that the protective armor also made the aircraft unmaneuverable. Standard Luftwaffe practice was to first knock out the rear gunner, then bring down the plane which inevitably tended to fly in a straight line. While built in larger numbers than any other type in World War II, the Sturmovik was also shot down in greater numbers than any other. If for many the ME-110 was found wanting as a destroyer because of its undoing at the hands of the RAF in the Battle of Britain, there is no justification in claiming it was a total failure given its sterling service with the Nachtflieger from 1940 until the end of the war. Bearing the England Blitz badge of the night fighters, it was the RAF's ever constant opponent in dark skies over the Reich. The notion that the Luftwaffe might need to develop a night fighting capability was not something that Hermann Goering in early 1940 regarded with seriousness. If needed at all, then he believed the combination of searchlights and heavy flak would see Germany through. In addition, a number of ME-109s had been allocated in 1939 to form an experimental moonlight squadron. In June 1940, Josef Kamhuber established the first night fighting division in Brussels following the beginning of the RAF's night raids in May. Casting around for aircraft to serve in the night fighter and intruder role led to Dornier being asked to adapt their DO-17Z medium bomber. Employing the nose cone from the JU-88C2 destroyer led to the appearance of the DO-17 Kautz. Only one was produced before the improved Kautz II left the production line. Just after the Battle of France, Hermann Goering appointed Hauptmann Wolfgang Falk, the commander of destroyer Geschwader I, to command the Luftwaffe's first Nacht Jagdgeschwader. NJG-1 was drawn from two Staffel and the first Gruppe of ZG-1 and sent to Dusseldorf for night fighter training. To these were added fourth Gruppe of JG-2. In July, the all-black 110s transferred to Venlo in Holland as part of the first night fighting division. No specialised equipment was added or modifications made to what were standard BF-110C destroyers. One of the earliest depictions of night fighter operations shown to German audiences in early 1942 is most revealing for what it does not show. Deutsche Wochenschau, filmed principally for home audiences, was also a vehicle for propaganda overseas, and many copies were dispatched abroad through neutral countries. These ended up in the UK, where they were studied with great care by intelligence operatives, seeking to glean every item of value from the images. It was for security reasons that the German film editors did not include in this sequence any coverage of the radars that were the actual key to their whole night fighting system. In this film, they have implied that observer sightings and sound directors are the source of the information used by the ground control. The system was known as Himmelbeck or four post of bed and was based on a belt of radar stations placed 20 miles apart. These ran along the coast of northern Germany from the Danish border southwestward through to the border of France and bisected the route taken by RAF night bombers on their way to Germany. Each radar station had its captive night fighter that was required to fly a continuous course that took it no further than 30 miles from each radar station. One Würzburg radar on site would track an incoming bomber, relaying the information back to the control room. The station would then employ its second Würzburg to vector its captive night fighter onto the RAF bomber traversing its box. One of the rising stars of the Nachtflieger was Major Lent, awarded the Knight's Cross in August 1941, following his 30th night victory. By January 1943, Lent had scored 50 victories. He's seen here with members of his second grouper, which he established at St. Tron in Belgium in November 1941. The incoming RAF raids spread out across a wide front is tracked first by the long-range Freya radars. They were sufficiently accurate to plot the direction and heading of the bombers and determine the general areas of the line they would penetrate and fly over. When this had been ascertained, the night fighter units would be scrambled to take up their position in the boxes. 
Befehl an Major Lenz. Es geht los. Er ist jetzt bereit. By the end of 1941, the ME-110 was the most numerous of all German night fighters. Although many of those employed were similar to their day fighter brethren, save in their all-black finish, in 1941 the first proper night fighting variant left Messerschmitt's production line. This was the F-4. It was equipped with more powerful engines and had the capacity to mount a heavier armament than an under-fuselage pannier. By March 1942, production of this specialized variant of the 110 was running at some 36 per month. Although construction of this defensive line had begun in 1941, by the beginning of 1942 it had acquired a formidable depth. But the RAF had not sat passively by and was striving to find the weaknesses in the system. The most obvious, once they gauged its workings, was that only one aircraft could be tracked and only one fighter vectored at any one time. It did not take long for a bomber to traverse a box 30 miles in extent, so the actual time available for a 110 to intercept the RAF aircraft was quite limited. Once this was realized, Bomber Command chose to swamp a given area of the line with a large number of planes following in one after the other. While one or two might be brought down, by far and away the bulk would get through. This tactic was used on May the 30th, 1942, when Bomber Command dispatched a thousand aircraft to hit Cologne with all flying the same route. 41 aircraft were lost, far fewer than would otherwise have been shot down. In what was developing into a sophisticated game of technological cat and mouse, it took the RAF longer to undermine Himmelbett, which they finally did in July 1943. One of the limitations of filmmaking during the war, not always readily appreciated today when special effects are commonplace, was the inability to capture genuine night fighter action. So, in an attempt to portray night fighting for the German audience, the propaganda department has mixed genuine footage of ground action with studio simulations employing models. 20mm flat guns, the searchlights and the interior of the command and control centre is genuine footage. Once the film cuts, however, to what purports to be a 110 night fighter, we are then looking at a model. All shots of the pilot inside the cockpit are also filmed on the ground. The film then shows the 110 shooting down what is meant to be an RAF Wellington bomber, but it too is a model. Of interest is the manner in which the 110 is shown approaching the bomber at a much steeper angle than was actually the case. Alongside the ME-110G2, 1942 also saw the appearance of the specialised, more heavily armed ME-110G4 night fighter. With the emergence of this 110 and also of the Ju-88 night fighters carrying the same Liechtenstein radar and mounting large nose-mounted antennae, film coverage of night fighters ceases altogether. In the air war above the Reich, each side was now employing devices in their planes that placed them on the cutting edge of the new black art of electronic warfare, wherein the need to preserve secrecy was paramount. The year 1943 had seen a steady rise in the sorties of the US 8th Army Air Force bomber squadrons flying out of England to attack targets in Germany. In a bid to provide a more effective air defense, the decision was taken in the autumn of 1943 to strengthen the air defense of the Reich by resurrecting the nearly defunct destroyer Gruppen. Serving alongside the more usual 110G2s was a new destroyer, although it bore more than a passing resemblance to the type that had sired it. Indeed, the ME410, which entered production with Messerschmitt in January 1943, was in effect a revamped 210, with all of its many problems eliminated. Although the Schnell bomber was deemed to be the primary variant, the war situation saw the destroyer version acquire growing significance to the Luftwaffe. In its light bomber role, the 410 began to appear in some numbers over the Mediterranean and was also encountered and shot down over England. By year's end, 457 ME410s had been delivered from the Augsburg factory. The production of a large number of field conversion kits saw it adapted to carry a variety of armament packages. 
Although a faster and more effective aircraft than the 110, it supplemented the earlier type rather than replaced it. Clearly, the older type still had an important role to play in the skies over Germany. Retaining the same bomb bay as the 210, the spacious compartment proved admirable for fitting of factory-supplied weapons containers. These permitted the type to carry an extra two 20mm cannon in addition to the standard inbuilt armament. It also permitted the 410 to carry much heavier weapons. External ETC-50 shackles could also be fitted for the carriage of bombs. Armament comprised of two nose-mounted 20mm cannon and two 7.92mm machine guns. The most interesting feature of the type's armament was carried over from the earlier ME-210 and employed two 13mm MG-131 machine guns in remotely controlled barbettes mounted on the side of the fuselage just below the rear of the canopy. These two guns were controlled and fired by a complex movement and sighting mechanism used by the rear gunner. The use of destroyers against US bombers saw an increase in armament. This ME-110G2 mounts two MG-151s in the nose and a 37mm cannon under its fuselage. The U-4 variant of the ME-410B2 saw a 50mm cannon derived from the Army Pac-38 anti-tank gun mounted in the weapons bay. One of the major weapons introduced onto ME-110 and ME-410s attacking bomber formations in 1943 was derived from the rocket launchers used by the Army. The 210mm version was an unguided weapon and carried a 47kg warhead to about 7,800 metres. The ME-110G2R3 variant carried four 210mm rockets in tubes outboard of the engines, as did the ME-410. Although the tubes affected the aerodynamics of both aircraft, increasing their drag and lowering their airspeed, this was deemed acceptable given their effectiveness in employing the rockets to break up US bomber formations. This then allowed the single-engined ME-109s and FW-190s to tear into the fray and shoot down the now less heavily protected B-17s and B-24s. Seen in the winter of 1943-44, these 110G2s are taking off to intercept an incoming US bombing raid. They carry a variety of armament. A number mount the rockets under wing, others two 30mm cannon in an under fuselage tray, and a few the 37mm cannon. Closing with the US bomber formation from above, the 110s fire off their rockets from a maximum range of about 6,000 feet, with the warhead primed to be exploded at between 1,800 and 3,500 feet. The release of a large number of these powerful rockets did succeed in breaking up many bomber formations. The 37mm cannon armed 110s also proved most effective. The weapon, essentially the same as used on the tank-busting variant of the Stuka, was more than destructive enough to destroy a B-17 or a B-24 with one shot. However, the weight of the weapon and its cumbersome container did little to aid the maneuverability of the ME-110. The most successful sortie for the 110s came on the 11th of January 1944 when they assailed a formation of 650 bombers on their way to bomb Brunswick, employing their rockets to first break up the Polk. Thereafter, they attacked the bombers, now devoid of their defensive formation, and downed 41 in conjunction with the single-engine fighters. The returning crew members looked very happy with their morning's work. Such sorties were only possible when the bombers were beyond the range of escorting fighters. Once the Americans had solved the range problem, the 110's days would be numbered. While ME-410's operated in conjunction with the 110's, they also flew destroyer sorties alone. A quick-thinking US bomber crewman snapped this shot of a 50mm cannon-armed 410 pulling away from his aircraft after it had made a firing pass. Film of the ME-410 is not extensive. 
And this sequence shows one returning to its base, the pilot waggling his wings to show that he's scored a victory. This particular variant is a 410A2R2. Two 30mm cannons have been mounted in the bomb bay to give the plane extra firepower. As soon as the plane has stopped, the ground crew, or black men as they were nicknamed because of the colour of their overalls, first congratulate the pilot and gunner, then set to work to get the aircraft ready for its next sortie. It was rare for air crew other than famous aces to be interviewed in such depth by the newsreel. But at this time, late 1943, early 1944, the destroyer Gruppen were contributing in a major fashion to the success the Luftwaffe was having in shooting down American bombers. Using their hands to demonstrate, as all fighter pilots do, this ME-410 crew described their shoot down of a B-17 and tell of how they approached the plane from slightly below before opening fire. It would seem their 410 variant was equipped with extra cannon, as they described the manner in which the heavy fire from their guns could be seen dancing across the plane's skin and causing it to burst into flame. The 30mm cannon used on some destroyers was a most formidable weapon. It could bring down a heavy bomber in just a few shots. American survivors recall the coordination between destroyers and single-seat fighters in their attacks on the bombers. Caught by the PK cameraman is a post-sortie meeting between the 410 Staffel commander and his men. Of interest is the atmosphere of joviality in the manner of the commander. While the tome of the whole sequence is decidedly triumphalist, a number of enemy bombers having just been shot down, it would be fascinating to gain some insight into the thoughts of these men to see what they really felt at seeing so many US bombers streaming across Germany day after day, seemingly increasing in number irrespective of how many they are shooting down. Such meetings would not, however, continue much longer as the fate of the destroyer Geschwaden in the opening months of 1944 was already sealed with the increasing range now being given to US day fighters in England. The addition of drop tanks to US escort fighters early in 1944 effectively sealed the fate of the ME-110 destroyers in the daylight air war over Germany. The 410s, by virtue of their higher speed, survived only a little longer. Thunderbolts and Mustangs could now hit the German heavy fighters before they could reach the bombers. The fate of the 110s of ZG-26 on March the 16th, 1944, is a classic example. Out of 43 committed, Mustangs accounted for no fewer than 26 in a matter of minutes. The subsequent loss rate was so high that the third grouper of the Geschwader disbanded within weeks, and by June 1944, only second grouper was flying 110s over Germany in daylight. The building of a huge bomber force was the largest single investment made by Great Britain during the Second World War. The Churchill bombing represented the only means available to hit back at Nazi Germany. By 1943, British industry was turning out large numbers of heavy four-engine bombers with which to carry the air war to the Reich by night. With production based upon three four-engined heavies, namely the Lancaster, the Halifax and the Stirling, Bomber Command underwent a major expansion. This was mirrored by the growing sophistication of its methods and of the electronic technology used for bombing aids and targeting. Under Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris, the priorities of the bomber campaign were identified as follows. The progressive destruction of the German military, industrial and economic system and the undermining of the morale of the German people to a point where their capacity for armed resistance is fatally weakened. In March 1943, the instruments available to him to attempt to realize these objectives comprised 321 Lancasters, 220 Halifaxes, 141 Stirlings, and 268 Wellingtons. March saw the launch of the Battle of the Ruhr, a sustained attempt by Bomber Command to destroy the productive capacity of Germany's premier industrial region. 
In July, the decision was taken to concentrate a series of heavy raids on one German city, and Operation Gomorrah was born. In concert with US day bombers, Bomber Command hit Hamburg in four great raids over 10 days. Chosen because it allowed a clear and unambiguous return on the new H2S bombing radar, the Hamburg raids were also important because they were begun with the dropping of millions of strips of aluminium foil which reflected the returns of the German Freya and Würzburg radars, rendering the Kamhuber line and the Himmelbett defence system impotent in the short term. German night fighters were thus unable to intercept British bombers in any significant numbers and the loss rate among the attacking aircraft was low. In all, 87 were lost, representing less than 3% of the aircraft committed. Other RAF technical advances also assisted the heavies. A device known as Boozer was fitted to give the bomber crews advance warning of the radar employed to lay the 88mm flat guns and their attendant searchlights. Then there was Monica, an early form of rear warning radar designed to tell the bomber of the proximity of a German night fighter. Although the employment of window had had a devastating short-term effect on the German night fighter defence, steps were rapidly taken to surmount the problems raised by it. Although Himmelbett had clearly been compromised, it was nevertheless still the basis of the whole system. Alternative methods that came online once the window problem was solved, including what came to be called tame bore. Night fighters carrying airborne radar were given a continuous running commentary from ground control in order to vector them into the general vicinity of an RAF bomber. The British response was to give false instructions on the same wavelength used by the German pilots to confuse them. Although Hermann Goering is seen here inspecting a 110 night fighter, the sometime chief of the Luftwaffe remained woefully ignorant of technical matters relating to the night fighter arm. Whilst the Luftwaffe had employed earlier variants of the Ju-88 in the night fighter role, it was only with the introduction of the G series in late 1943 that the type really began to fulfil its potential. When the British captured this particular plane in July 1944, they discovered that its Flensburg radar was attuned to the Monica tail warning radars employed by RAF bombers to warn them of the approach of German night fighters. The entry into service of the G1 coincided with a marked rise in RAF losses in early 1944 and was to continue flying until war's end in 1945. The G6 variant employed more powerful Junkers Umo inline engines to give the type higher speed. Although the radar combinations were some of the most sophisticated, it arrived too late to make any significant impact on the air war. This G6 allows us to view the fixed angled guns mounted atop the fuselage to allow the Ju-88 and ME-110 to fire into the vulnerable belly of RAF bombers. Operating up to a range of 30 miles, the Naxos passive homing device fitted on top of the canopy allowed JU-88s to fix the positions of RAF bombers by the emissions from their H-2S bombing radar. The ferocity of the air war and the darkness over Germany can be illustrated by examining RAF bomber losses between January 1943 and March 1944. This period covered the battles of the Ruhr, Hamburg and Berlin. 5,881 British heavy bombers were lost in this period. German night fighter crews, although accounting for most of these RAF planes brought down, had also suffered heavy losses. Another bomber type converted to the night fighter role, albeit in small numbers, was the Dornier DO-217. Employing both radial and inline engines, the Liechtenstein-equipped J and N variants were not a success, the type being found to be too heavy, slow and cumbersome for the night fighting role. It was taken off active service by 1944. Night fighter aces were fated by the German press in the same fashion as the single seat fighter aces. The highest scoring of the Nachtflieger was Wolfgang Schnaufer, who shot down 121 aircraft in 164 operational sorties. On October 16, 1944, 
He was awarded the diamonds to his Knight's Cross at the same ceremony as Jagdwaffe ace Eric Hartmann received his from Hitler at his headquarters at Rastenburg in East Prussia. All of Schnaufer's kills were made in a 110 G4. He served as Gruppen commander of 4 NJG1. Schnaufer survived the war only to die in a motoring accident in 1950. Oberst Helmut Lent, commander of NJG3 and holder of the Knight's Cross with diamonds, achieved 105 victories. He died in an accident in October 1944 when he and his two crewmen crashed in their 110 at Paderborn in bad visibility. Prince Sein Wittgenstein scored 83 victories, the bulk of his kills employing the Ju-88. He was shot down and killed on the 21st of May 1944. In the course of the air war in the night skies over Germany, circumstances often forced the defenders to adopt unusual methods for downing RAF bombers. Following the introduction of window in 1943, an ex-bomber pilot named Heio Hermann proffered the idea of employing single-seat day fighters to attack RAF bombers fixed by German searchlights over the target area. Devoid of radar direction until such time as the German boffins found a way to counter window, Hermann was ordered by Goering to form a special unit. Taking the name of Wild Boar to describe their methods, ME 109s and FW 190s, crewed in the main by ex bomber pilots, flew in the skies above Hamburg and Berlin. In two raids on the capital on the 24th and 25th of August and 1st of September 1943, Hermann's fighters shot down 56 and 47 RAF heavies. On the 4th September, another 26 were brought down. Believed by many in Germany's night fighter arm to have been the aircraft that could have won the air war was the Heinkel HE-219. Indeed, some say it was the best night fighter of the war. Although many of the claims for the performance of the type have been questioned since, there is no doubting that, had it entered full production, the 219 might have changed the odds in the night skies over Germany. That it did not has much to do with the internal wrangling between different interest groups in the Luftwaffe. The most important voice against the 219 was Field Marshal Erhard Milch. Charged with oversight of aircraft production, he was firmly of the opinion that the 219 was a plane too many and that its role could best be carried out by the Ju-88. Heinkel managed to produce a total of 195 of the 219s, with another 73 being produced and employed for research purposes. Those that flew shot down 104 heavy bombers. Another type that did not enter production but was also thought of as a potential destroyer as well as a night fighter was Kurt Tank's wooden TA-154. Indeed, the specification for this type flowed from the requirement for a two-seat night fighter with a long loiter time and a heavy armament of two 20mm and two 30mm cannon. First flown on July the 1st, 1943, following extensive testing, a production line was set up in 1944. However, problems with bonding the wood on the airframe and the adoption of the emergency fighter program in November 1944 brought an end to all further work on the type. The most radical and potentially effective of all the types to be conceived, both as a destroyer and as a knack Jäger, was the Dornier DO-335. Better known as the Arrow, this type employed both a pusher and a tractor propeller. The prototype first flew on October the 26th, 1943. By September 1944, a unit had been set up to test the operational characteristics of the Arrow, and the DO-335A1 was on the assembly lines. However, the war situation was declining, and although a most promising type, the 335 remained at war's end, just a fascinating might have been. With Germany's surrender in May 1945, the former airfields of the night fighters were a litter of destroyed and abandoned aircraft. For five years, destroyer and knack Jäger had been key types in the Luftwaffe's inventory, had played a major role in the years of victory and had fought hard along the road to defeat. <laughs>